Hello everyone and welcome back to AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. We're going to continue on with our conversation of maps. Last time we just went over some of the basics of maps, talking about map properties and those types of things. And now we're going to talk about the specific types of maps and map projections that we can see. And I'm going to show you some different examples. Uh, so when we talk about map projections and we talk about the different properties of maps, uh, these first couple of maps we're going to look at uh, really just try to purely maintain one of the different properties of the maps. And so uh, they're kind of in a category that you're not going to see a whole lot of them. Uh, you're not going to see a whole lot of these by themselves because of the way that they really try to maintain one of the specific properties of the map. So we have what's called equal area, conformal, or orthomorphic, azimuthal, and then equidistant. Uh, so let's go through each of these. So the first one we'll look at is what's called the equal projection or the equal area projection. Uh, and you can see if we look at this world map here, the, the main purpose of the equal area projection. And a lot of people have actually uh, actually liked this type of projection a little bit better is because what it does is it maintains uh, a correct representation of the area of the Earth's surface that the land mass takes up. Now this looks a little bit different, especially maybe if you've uh, if you've been looking at your textbooks or things, because uh, some of the some of the countries or continents don't necessarily look as large. Uh, some of the some of the best examples of that would be uh, Canada, uh, of course Canada is not a continent but a country, and Alaska up here part of the United States and, and Greenland uh, is really one of the ones that a lot of people point to, especially as you look at it in relationship to uh, South America. Now of course the problem is that it's very difficult to see the coastlines and the shores uh, and get a good feel for what exactly are the shapes of the different countries and land masses, but again it does maintain uh, correct uh, a correct area in relationship to uh, each uh, each landmass and also the surface. Now, and we'll talk more about this as we get uh, into some of our other projections. The next one is called a conformal projection. This one maybe looks a little bit uh, a little bit more familiar to you, especially if those of you are familiar with the Mercator projection map, which is what uh, conformal is, or Mercator is a conformal projection. So you see this; it's uh, it maintains the shape of the land masses. And of course, with the conformal, it's impossible to have a conformal and then also an equal area map at the same time because of the way that you're trying, because of the two different purposes. One is is trying to maintain the uh, the land mass, or at least the representation of the land mass, and the other is trying to maintain the shape. And so you see what's happened here as we get closer to each of the poles, the land masses get stretched out in order to show their correct shape. And so you see how large Greenland has gotten. And, and, in relationship to South America or even even Africa, and then again you kind of get this prominence of of kind of the northern countries, the Nordic countries of Europe, and the co northern coastline of Russia and Canada, Alaska, so forth and so on. Um, and then of course Antarctica down here has has ballooned in size. Anyway, uh, you can see the definite difference between the two. The next is what we call an azimuthal projection, uh, and one of the purposes of the azimuthal projection is to try and Maintain correct direction uh, as it's represented on uh, as it's represented on the map in relationship to uh, and to the Earth's surface. Uh, so you can see some of the sizes and some of the shapes are a little bit uh, distorted on these particular maps with the direction of the different um, uh, the, the direction of the different land masses is kept the same. And you have what's called the equidistant projection, and you can definitely see that. Uh, the sizes or the uh, the shape, not the shape, but the sizes of these are uh, the land masses are distorted. But the whole purpose here is you're trying to maintain correct distance as you show uh, the different land masses. You can see how large uh, Australia has gotten uh, so that it can maintain correct distance between the different land masses, whether it be Africa or Antarctica, so forth and so on. So you can see each of these um, each of these properties of the map how they're distorted based upon you know what exactly what I guess really what uh, what level of integrity or what not as level of integrity but what representation or what exactly is the cartographer trying to do. Now let's go to some of the actual uh, projections that are used that actually kind of combine some of these different uh, projections to create you know, various forms of distortion so that uh, we get the maps that we use in our textbooks and reference uh, catalogs and things along those lines. So uh, the types of projections that we're most used to seeing um, is what's called the Mercator and the Robinson projection. We'll talk about that more here in just a second. Um, but typically when we look at a map, whether it be a National Geographic or a magazine or uh, you know, a news periodical, newspaper, um, in our textbooks, uh, those projections really are going to use a combination of each of the projections that I just showed you. 
uh, and they're going to show a slight distortion of some of the properties of maps, but not necessarily. Um, they're not necessarily going to uh, to hold to one projection or the other. The most common that we again see are the Mercator and the Robinson, and we'll, we'll look at those here in just a second. Okay, so if we look at the uh, Mercator projection again, this has actually been in use for hundreds of years. Uh, this was actually used in textbooks when I was a student in school, and I remember it very well. And again, uh, it's been it's been uh, accused of being uh, Western centric, Euro centric. Uh, you see here this one. You have a map of the United States in the center because, of course, the United States is the center of world, uh, as a lot of people like to think. Uh, we talked about the land masses, and a lot of again, a lot of people say that one of the reasons you have these land masses so shown as so large and prominent is because. Uh, you want to have uh, kind of this symbol of dominance over some of the other countries, whether it be uh, countries within Africa or South America. Uh, so that's seen, that's seen as that a lot of times. Now you see this map actually uh, does, does show uh, a connection between uh, the United States and Russia, and so it actually shows that representation there. Um, and also uh, people talk about how it's... Um, it's biased because, of course, you know the United States and Europe are on top. The other countries are on the bottom, again, showing a, uh, a dominant position. So that is one of the main reasons why we've actually seen a large change over to the Robinson projection. Um, but actually, the Mercator projection was used by uh, European sailors as they were coming over from Europe, and they were trying to, to sail directly over to the United States. And, of course, it was a dangerous journey, and so they, were, uh, they would use these Mercator projections um, to help them find their way. So again, today in, in today's schools and textbooks, a lot of times we see uh, the Robinson projection. Uh, now, the Robinson projection is used a lot more because basically what it does, it takes all those different uh, distortions that I talked to you about, and it, it takes each property and distorts it just slightly and doesn't do an incredible radical distortion of any of the properties. And so it gives you maybe just a better feel uh, for what the world actually looks like and the land masses and the representation uh, and their relationship uh, to one another. So more than likely, if you opened your textbook, it's a relatively new edition, you would have a Robinson projection in your text. Now, a lot of people are advocating for the use of the Peters projection, which you see uh, looks very similar to the equal area projection. Uh, and the reason for that is because they believe that it gives, a, it, it, it gives a more realistic picture of the world. It helps to represent, especially South American and the African uh, continents a little bit better in terms of their size and relationship to uh, North America and, uh, and Europe and as a result would help to give them higher prominence in the world because again that, that whole argument that with a smaller size they're seen as less important uh, so forth and so on and there's this really funny clip that a lot of people like to show on YouTube um, from the West Wing and they, they go through this whole conversation but anyway you can probably uh, Google that for yourself if you would like Another projection we have is called the Fuller projection. Now this is taken from what's called the North Polar projection, and we call it the North Polar projection because we're staring down the world from the North Pole. And you see this, the whole idea of the, the Fuller projection is to try and maintain correct size and shape, but of course you can see that uh, direction is, is greatly distorted. Uh, so this definitely gives you a much different perspective of the world, especially kind of from the North Pole as you see the relationship between North America uh, and Asia and really how, how they're, we a lot of times think that they're really far apart, but they're really not if you, uh, if you consider uh, their proximity to one another from uh, the North Pole. And the last type of map that I'm going to talk to you about here uh, for just a second is what's called a cognitive map or also a mental map. Uh, basically, these are the maps of the world and the maps of our immediate surroundings and our community that we formulate for ourselves. So uh, it, what, it, what a cognitive map or a mental map does for us helps us to understand really our own uh, perspective, the way that we see the world and the way that we uh, are going to view the world uh, from our own experiences and our own interactions with the place around us. Um, and so, of course, cognitive maps are going to be unique, very unique uh, to every single individual. And one of the things that we need to recognize is every individual has perspective, every individual has point of view, uh, so this is not going to be anything that's, uh, that's necessarily, uh, necessarily wrong, it's just the way that things are. Uh, now, of course, people say that every map is biased. In fact, I might encourage you to go to, uh, to, go to Google and, and search out maybe maps as propaganda, and you'll get to see a lot of the different maps that have been created 
uh, and, and how those can be used as propaganda. But again, these cognitive maps or these mental maps really help us to see you know, what is it that we're aware of in our world and how do we organize things in our world and how do we see the world in which we, uh, we interact with on a daily basis. So anyway, that's our conversation on maps. I hope you found that to be helpful. Um, we're going to be concluding we're going to be concluding the unit in our next uh, video with conversations on scale and the different uh, types of map categories as far as how we display and look at information on maps.